Well, it's a, a joy to be here and a joy to get to see uh, many of you who we've known in the past and people who are dear friends and uh, get to meet new people. Good to visit with Aaron a few minutes ago. We kind of known each other a little bit through email, but uh, good to get to meet people face to face. And I was thinking about when Ron was talking about the age thing. A number of years ago um, at the Louisville Church, where I was preaching at the time, and now Keith Harris is the preacher. I, I've told people Keith Harris is my preacher now. That's a good, really a good, a good feeling for me. But uh, uh, we had a, a young man who was uh, eight years old at the time. And uh, I was standing in the back at the door waiting for people to come out. And he would always come out and shake my hand. And his name was Will. And Will, at eight years old, walked up to me and he shook, his, shook my hand. And he said, Brother Jeff, he said, um, is there some time I could come by the office and meet with you? And I said, sure, Will. And he said, I have some questions I want to ask you because I think someday I want to be a preacher. And he pulled out his phone and he said, uh, I'm available Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. And I said, okay, that, that'll work for me. And so Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., his mother dropped him off. He was out of school that day. And he came into my office and he sat down and he said, Brother Jeff, he said, uh, I, I have some questions I want to ask you. I wrote them here on my phone. And he said, uh, I want to talk to you about being a preacher. And the first thing I want to know is, how long have you been preaching and how old are you? And I said, I think at the time I was about 51 or 52, uh, 53, and I've been preaching 35 years or so. And he, his eyes got real big when I told him how old he was. I was. And he looked at me and he said, Brother Jeff, he said, you're just like my grandfather. You're going to go see Jesus real soon. <laughs> so... Uh, so I've thought, thought about that a lot, and, and uh, uh, fear, actually uh, about a year after that, we were on a, a church-wide family uh, trip to Colorado. We, we went up uh, just to get away and to have families together, and we did some hiking, and I had, uh, I had a, a stick, a big stick I'd gotten, and there was a boy, little boy walking along with me. His name was Jackson. And he got a stick, and we were kind of, I was asked to kind of stay in the back and make sure everybody, Kevin Langford was up front, I think, and I was asked to kind of make sure everybody stayed with the group. And we were back there, and we were walking, and I said, um, I, I said, Austin, I said, um, you know, we're kind of like, um, uh, we're kind of like Joshua and Caleb. We're spying out the land here. And he said, no, he said, Brother Jeff, you're a lot more like Moses. So, you know, sometimes that age thing kind of kind of uh, jumps up and bites you. So this the theme for this particular class is called Preaching Matters. And yesterday, what we did, if you weren't here, is we talked about some biblical principles from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 4 that deals with why preaching matters from a biblical context. And what I want to do today is I want to share uh, really in the time that we have three uh, different sections of, of thoughts here about some, uh, some matters concerning preaching. In, in, in our work, when we talk to preachers, a lot of times uh, what we find is that a lot of preachers uh, struggle with discouragement. And so what, what I thought I would do in this session is I want to talk a little bit about discouragement in the life of the preacher, and then I want to talk about how we can encourage one another as preachers, how we, how we can be of encouragement to one another. And uh, if we have time after that, just a little bit about our relationships. So we do a lot of surveys with the Jenkins Institute, and we did one survey about, um, about discouragement, and what we found was that about 97% of all preachers get discouraged at some point, and, and maybe often. Uh, 2% of all preachers may deal with it much less than the rest, and uh, 1% of all preachers are not telling the truth. That's what we found out. Um, and so a couple of truths about discouragement in preaching that I want to mention. Uh, number one, the nature of preaching itself can bring about discouragement uh, because of the battles that we face in ministry. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 10, Paul talked about that. And remember, he talked about the fact that, that he had all of this going on in his life, um, all of the trials and tribulations. And then you remember what Paul said, besides all of that, I have the weight of the church on me daily. And if you're a preacher, and if you've been a preacher, you, you understand, or if you're married to a preacher, you understand exactly what Paul meant when he said that. 
Because sometimes in preaching, we have this feeling that not only are we trying to deal with family issues and and even personal issues and financial struggles and, and all of the other aspects, but sometimes you feel like you've got the weight of the church on you. And you feel like whether it's whether it's true or not, whether somebody has has told you that, has led you to believe that, you just feel like you've got this heavy weight on you that you're you're carrying around and you're trying um, to carry the church on sometimes on your back. Um, the second aspect of this discouragement thing is that the task of preaching is full of potential landmines uh, for discouragement. And so I want to I want to just uh, give you a list of the things I've written down here. Number one. Uh, so what are those landmines? What are those possible landmines? Number one um, is uh, falling short of our own expectations. Um, you ever feel like you, you just, uh, you know, you preach your heart out, you study all day, uh, you study all week long, you get up on Sunday, you preach your heart out all day long, and then, you know, n- nobody comes out and tells you uh, what a great job you did or or, or how, what a great preacher you are, or maybe even more so, everybody comes out and tells you what a great job you did and what a great preacher you are. But one person comes out and says, that sermon really wasn't very much today. And, uh, you, you know, it's interesting that you might forget the 500 people who commended you and only remember the one who didn't. And part of that is because whether somebody does that to us or we do it ourselves, we put a lot of expectations on the work that we are trying uh, to do. And so, so number one is falling short of your own expect, expectations. Number two is negative feedback, uh, negative feedback. The, the first, uh, uh, I went to preach for the, what was it, at the time, the College Church of Christ in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, on the campus of Faulkner University. And uh, um, there was a, uh, now it's a university church, there was a man who, who came out to me uh, on my first Sunday after I preached, and he handed me a note, and he said, I I want you to read this later. So I got in my car, and I read the note, and what he had done is he had written down uh, two or three words that I had mispronounced and a couple of verses that I had misquoted. Well, he did that every single week, every week. And, uh, you know, I I got to where I, I talked to my wife about it, and she said, if he gives you a note, she said, don't read it. Just fold it up and on the way out the door, throw it in the trash can. And so that's kind of what I started doing. So um, there, there was a man who moved to work at Faulkner University. And um, his name, he was Brother Wendell Winkler. Some of you will remember Brother Winkler. And Brother Winkler came up to me his first Sunday. He was, he was the head of the uh, Department of Biblical Studies. And he worshiped with us when he was in town. Uh, for about 10 years, and he came up to me the first Sunday he was there, and he said to me, he said, um, I took some notes on your sermon, <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, here, you know, here we go again. He said, uh, that was really good stuff. Do you mind if I use it sometime? And so oftentimes he would come out and, and say words of encouragement, but sometimes the negative feedback uh, causes potential uh, discouragement in our life. And to add to that, the third thought is, what I call absurdly positive feedback. You know, sometimes uh, people, you know, they'll walk up to you and they'll say, um, that was the greatest sermon on that subject that I have ever heard in my life. And when somebody tells me that, I think they're not telling the truth because I'm thinking there's been a lot of sermons preached on that. That can't be the greatest one uh, they've ever heard. Uh, Number four, um, a lack of tangible uh, change uh, in the life of the church or growth in the church. Uh, if you're preaching for a church for some time and it's not growing or people aren't seem to be growing spiritually, that can cause discouragement. Uh, number, uh, number five, a lack of a dream uh, in the life of the leadership. Um, sometimes preachers feel like that we're driving, kind of driving the train as it were, and we're making all the suggestions and, and we're having all of the ideas and maybe the le- rest of the leadership is not. And so that can cause potential uh, discouragement. Uh, the next one on my list is what I call non-preaching issues. And that would be things like family matters and financial concerns and, and health concerns and uh, just a whole laundry list of, of other things. And then uh, uh, add to that, if you have aging parents, 
if you have uh, small children, uh, raising children, uh, marriage problems, family problems, and then, of course, uh, the devil himself. Well, um, I want to share with you some thoughts about that ought to bring encouragement to us based upon 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So here are my thoughts. Uh, number one, uh, remember that God is the one who gives us grace and peace in our lives. Uh, Paul began the letter to the Corinthians with that phrase, grace and peace, which, by the way, that is Paul's signature greeting. Uh, in every book that we know for a fact that Paul wrote, within the first seven verses, you'll find grace and peace, caris and arene, in every single book that we know he wrote. Uh, he didn't, you don't have that in the first seven verses of the book of Hebrews, and that's another reason some of the scholars think that he didn't write Hebrews. But you do have it, interestingly enough, did you know that the idea of grace and peace is in the last chapter, in the last few verses of the book of Hebrews? So some people say, well, he included it, he just put it at the end because he forgot to put it at the beginning. And then there's that story that they used to tell at Fried Hardeman about the professor who would, who would uh, the way he would call on the preacher students in his classes to answer a question was he would raise a question and then he would call somebody's name and say, would you stand up and answer that question? And there was a boy who was asleep in the class and he was talking about the book of Hebrews and he said, John, would you tell, uh, stand up and tell us who wrote the book of Hebrews? And it startled the guy and he woke up and he jumped up. He didn't hear the question. And so he just said, he said, professor, uh, I used to know the answer to that question, but I've forgotten. And the professor said, what a pity. The only man alive who knows who wrote Hebrews has forgotten. <laughs> well, some, you know, sometimes uh, uh, we, we don't know, but the, but the idea is that God is the one who gives grace and peace. Uh, number two, uh, based on 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, remember that um, God is the God of all comfort, uh, verses 6 and 7. Our God is the one who will give us the greatest comfort in our lives. Now, sometimes... Sometimes God will use his people. Sometimes God will use your wife. Sometimes he will use uh, your family members. Sometimes he will use uh, people in the church. But he is the one who is the God of all comfort. And so we should rely on him uh, for comfort and peace more than we do anybody else. Uh, number three, remember that our suffering may result in the comfort and salvation of others. That's verses 8 through 10. That whatever you're dealing with in your life, whatever it is, if you handle it correctly and you rely upon the God of all comfort, God says you should take that comfort that I have given you, which you've been comforted with, and use that comfort to do what? To comfort others. And so, so what, a, uh, what a tremendous thought. And, and uh, you know, sometimes I talk about my wife and some people think I do that too much. Um, uh, but, uh, um, you know, my attitude about that is I don't care what you think about that because I'm the one up here talking so I talk about her because I believe that God has comforted me through, the, through his people. And if I don't use the comfort that I've received from him to try to help comfort others, then I'm not doing what the scriptures uh, tell us. Uh, number, um, number four, um, remember that our hope is not in ourselves, but it is in God, his power, and his deliverance. Uh, again, verses 8 through 10. Uh, number five, remember uh, gratefully that there are people who are praying for you when you are discouraged. That's what Paul says in verse 11, that there are people who are praying for you when you're discouraged. Don't ever forget that. And, and I would encourage you, if you're going through times of discouragement in your ministry or in your preaching or in your life, to talk to certain people. Now, there's some people you don't want to talk to about that. Uh, I don't know. It, it would depend on your relationship with your elders if you wanted to talk to them about that or not. It would depend on your relationship with friends at church. It may be another preacher who doesn't work with you or who's in another place, but have somebody who you can talk to and, and ask them to pray for you and encourage you. Um, number, uh, number six, verses 12 and 13, remember to continue to develop a sincere and holy conscience. Um, Paul talked about the fact that he lived before God with a pure, pure conscience. Um, the next one, Remember to think of the souls uh, that you will rejoice in on the day of Christ. Um, that's verse 14. Paul rejoiced in the people that he had taught. Uh, remember to make every, um, every visit 
uh, when you're talking with people who are children of God, remember to make every visit an experience of God's grace. And so when you go see people, when you visit them, when you have appointments with them, when you meet with them, don't, don't let that be a burden. But remember, this is, should be an experience of God's grace. And what will happen is your life will be enriched and their life will be enriched. We, we had a, started a visitation program for men on Tuesday morning years and years ago at Louisville. And the reason we did that is because one man had lost his wife. And he came to me and he said, I've got to do something. He said, I, I don't know what to do. I've got to do something. I, I can't preach. I can't teach. But I want to. I said, Bobby, what if, what if you and I got together on Tuesday mornings and, and you went to visit with me? And, and we did that. And another man lost his wife. And he joined us. And a bunch of other men. And before long, the elders started coming. And we had a big group who would meet together every Tuesday morning. And they'd sit around and, and, and chat for a while around the table. And then the ladies wanted to get involved. And they started making homemade cookies to take to the people. And uh, we talked about how... We'd, after that, we'd go to lunch together, and when we'd get together, we'd always often talk about how we went to try to encourage somebody, but we walked away encouraged. And you've experienced that uh, in, in your own life as well. Um, next, remember that all the promises of God in Christ will never fail. The promises of God in Christ will never fail. That's verses 18 through 20. Um, remember that God has given us His Spirit as a guarantee that's verses 20 and 21. And remember that we work with others to know God's joy so that we stand together in our faith. That's verses 23 and 24. And so um, all preachers will probably face discouragement at some point in their life. And Paul helps us biblically with that. But in a practical way, uh, how can we uh, encourage one another? And so if you're a preacher and you've ever dealt with discouragement, um, and if you're a preacher, you've dealt with discouragement, but if you recognize that you have, there's chances that you know another preacher who has as well. And you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have a, a PhD degree in counseling and be licensed or anything like that to, to bring encouragement. And so what are some ways that we can encourage? My dad had a, a sermon one time that I heard him preach, and he called it Mr. Brother Encourager. And uh, that was the title of the sermon, Mr. Brother Encourager. And he says that the apostles gave nicknames to Joseph. They called him Encourager. And um, he said uh, he didn't get that name accidentally. It was earned. And so we ought to resolve in our hearts that we want to be known as an encourager. Uh, and um, I believe that there, there are uh, in the lives of, of preachers, particularly and probably generally all men, but particularly, there are three types of men that we need in our lives, three types of men. I want to share these with you. Number one, every preacher needs someone like the Apostle Paul in their life. I don't mean by that, you know, somebody who's inspired, or I don't even mean by that somebody who's figured it all out or who's got it all together, but somebody who, who has experienced life and who can help pour into our lives what they've learned. And, and if you're particularly, if you're a young preacher, you need, you need some Barnabases in your life, or some Pauls in your life, some men who, will, uh, who can help you along, who you can ask questions to, who, who you can call and, and uh, ask them about things that you're dealing with in your ministry and in your work. And, and uh, I think all of us need some Pauls in our life. Um, when we moved to North MacArthur Church, uh, it's been 27, 28 years ago now. Um, I was relatively young then uh, still, and uh, I was still relatively green about preaching and ministry. And in that church, uh, we started having a lot of retired preachers who moved to the area, and they would come to church with us. And, and we had at one time 20 retired preachers in the church there. I used to tell people, so what do you do with all those guys? And I said, well, they're all sitting on the front row hoping I'm sick every Sunday, you know, so they can, uh, they can get up and preach. But uh, uh, we had a Bill Smith. Uh, some of you may know Bill Smith was an old preacher, and he wrote those little yellow class books, uh, workbooks that some of you might have used in the past. He was a great preacher, a great man of God. And um, I spent many, many hours with him and I would ask him questions about his prayer life and about, about his family life and about how to deal with elders and different things like that. And his wife said, uh, she, she made the comment one time, she said, old preachers 
need to come to church at North MacArthur because Jeff collects old preachers. Well, now I'm an old preacher. I don't collect them anymore. Now I try to collect young preachers. But every preacher needs some people like Paul in their life. Number two, every preacher and every man needs some people like Barnabas in their life. Somebody who, uh, who is close to our age, close to your age, close to your what we, would, what we call life stage. Somebody who's a friend who you know and who knows you well. And, and they're, they are, um, when you go through difficulties in life, they'll be the first ones by your side. When, um, when, they, uh, when you mess up and you need somebody to talk to you, they'll tell you, you know, um, Jeff, uh, you're not spending enough time with your family. And uh, um, uh, God knows it and, and your family knows it and the church knows it and it's about time you should know it. We need some people like that in, in our lives. We need some people who are in our kind of life stage who are close to us. Um, when my wife got sick, um, she actually first got sick in Oklahoma City, and she dealt with cancer off and on for uh, nearly 25 years. Most of those years were good years. She felt well. She had been through treatments, but it kept coming back, and she kept having to go through more treatments. And, and that last uh, the last time, the last two years of her life were very, very difficult years, particularly the last year of her life. It, but there are, there, are, <clears throat> there are five men um, who are preachers uh, in my life who, who um, kind of, it's not a necessarily good way to look at it, but we kind of talk about kind of the inner circle people, the people that we kind of let into our life and they know us the best and, and they're always there for us and uh, those people have names like, uh, like Paul Shiro and uh, uh, Ralph Gilmore and um, Steve Bailey and Bill Watkins. And those guys, uh, five of us, have become very, very close through the years. And those guys will talk to me and, and, and be honest with me, and, and that's what you want. So you need some guys like that in your life. And then number three, uh, we all, all of us need some people uh, like Timothy and Titus in our life, some younger people who we kind of try to pour our lives into, um, people who we can, again, not because we've arrived, those of us who are older, or we've got it all figured out, or we know all the answers, but we can help them because we've experienced something you know, in life that might be of help to them. And so how, how do you encourage a, a preacher who is going through discouragement? So I, I wrote down a list here. Uh, about seven things, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about them, but I want to mention each one. Number one, when you see or hear about a struggling preacher, reach out to him. Uh, all preachers struggle. We're all human. Uh, we have to remove the facades that we, we don't struggle. Otherwise, we can't bear each other's burdens. Uh, we have to be honest. If we all leave the impression that everything in our life is roses and perfection, then we look like hypocrites. And so when you see somebody or hear somebody who's struggling, pick up the phone and call them. Uh, send them an email. Uh, write them a note. Um, I have a friend who's a preacher in Texas, and uh, he lives far away from where I live. And when Laura was going through her illness, he, he would text me or call me every single week. We didn't see each other through the whole time, not face to face. But he would text me or call me every single week. And so uh, when you hear about a struggling preacher, reach out to him. Number two, uh, share in each other's ministry. Um, we really are on the same team, right? We're not, we're not competing lighthouses. Uh, we're not trying to one-up the other preacher. It's not a matter of, uh, uh, I mentioned a group of preachers that are kind of really close friends of mine. Uh, I have to tell you, there's some big egos in that group right there. Some big, some big egos, but we kind of sometimes. I'm not going to call any names, but sometimes, you know, we have to. Uh, we, we, but, but the the thing is, it's okay because we're sharing in each other's ministry, and we know that we're on the same team, and and um, there's no petty jealousy, or uh, I don't think there's any insecurities that are there. Um, but predetermine that you will not allow uh, that you will not let the things that destroy the richness of unity between brothers and between congregations. Um, so offer help. Um, you can ask questions, leading questions. What are you excited about in your ministry uh, that, that I can help you with? What are you struggling to get done that I can, I can pray about for you? Ask each other what you can pray about. 
So share in their ministry. Number three, when a fellow preacher stumbles in sin or is dismissed, uh, he feels rotten and useless, like God is never going to use him again. Um, but we need to be people, again, who will reach out and who will encourage. Uh, if a guy's been through a difficult patch, if he's lost his job, if, even if you don't know why he's lost his job, um, don't pile on. Uh, he's got enough people piling on. Be somebody who will listen, uh, who, will, who will pray, and who will encourage. Number four, uh, if you are a veteran preacher, find a younger preacher or more than one and contact them and take them out for a meal or a cup of coffee or a glass of tea. Uh, let them know you understand what they're dealing with. Uh, tell them that you've been there and you'll be available to try to help them. Uh, number five, if you're a younger preacher, find an older preacher who you can respect more than uh, one, per, uh, preferably, and uh, call him and ask him questions about ministry and about situations. Um, number six, uh, just make phone calls and send texts just to encourage. Uh, think about, here, here's your assignment when you leave this class today. Think about a preacher you know in, a, in an area, maybe close to you or maybe not close to you, who might feel a little bit isolated, and just send him a text. Say a prayer for him and send him a text and say, just want you to know I was thinking about you. I'm praying for you. If I can help you anyway, let me know. You'll never know what good that might do for somebody. And you might build a relationship that will be a wonderful, wonderful relationship. Now, be honest, you know, um, you've seen the, the meme about a preacher who, who sees Bob coming through the door back there. And he remembers that Bob asked him last week to, to pray for him. And so Bob is getting closer and he prays and he says, Dear God, please bless Bob. And then Bob gets up to him and said, Bob, I've been praying for you. You know, that's not what we're talking about. We don't want to lie, but we want to be honest. Uh, number seven, um, when a preacher, a new preacher moves into your area, uh, visit him. Get to know him. Get some other preachers together and uh, take him to lunch. Um, uh, spend some time with him. Uh, ask him about his family and ask him about where he's from and what he's done in his life and and encourage him in every way uh, that you can. So I want to carry this one step further and talk just a minute before we quit about how we can build a stronger relationships in ministry. Um, so here's some thoughts. Number one, a ministry without any relationships is going to die. A minister without any relationships is going to die. Um, there is a direct relationship and correlation between relationships and church health as well as uh, relationships and church growth. Um, a minister who has no friends and no uh, real relationships um, is going to struggle in his work. And he's going to struggle with church health and church growth. And so, um, so it's important uh, that we build relationships. Number two, seek to relate well to all kinds of people. Uh, to seek to relate well to all kinds of people. I believe that when a preacher begins uh, in a new work, particularly a young preacher, he ought to work overtime to get to know the little children and the old people. Get to know the little children and the old people. Because if you do, if you get to know the old people, they will love you forever. If you get to know the little children, their parents will love you. And you've covered all the bases. So uh, relate well to all kinds of people. Uh, next, when looking at the value relationships, uh, people fall into two major extremes. Number one, highly introverted and self-sufficient, or, or highly introverted or self-sufficient, where they think they don't need any friends. Um, um, and uh, number two, uh, they're people who are highly extroverted or they're too reliant on other people. And that can be a problem as well. I don't believe either of those would be the correct view of ministry. So uh, here are my last thoughts about relationships, 10 of them. I won't spend much time just to give them to you. Number one, um, relationships for a minister are essential. They are essential. Uh, number two, relationships require work and effort. They require work and effort. Uh, number three, relationships can be fragile. It can be fragile. Uh, I'm thinking of a young preacher friend who who um, tried, to, tried to be close to through the years, who has struggled and, um, 
he has struggles with all kinds of relationships with all people. And uh, he's burned bridges and he's hurt people. And so if you put yourself out there to build a relationship with somebody, just remember sometimes those relationships can be fragile. Uh, number four, relationships are valuable. Uh, uh, time will show you this, that relationships are valuable. Number five, um, relationships will change over time. Uh, through the years, you'll meet people and you'll build a relationship with them. And then over time, that will decrease. And it may have to do with moving from one location to the other. It may have to do with uh, children coming into your lives at different times. Um, and so, uh, uh, so they, they may change. But guess what? You'll build other relationships. And um, I've moved about three times in my preaching life. And uh, everywhere I've moved, I've left some people behind who who the relationship seemed to decrease and it wasn't as strong as it was when we were uh, in close proximity. But guess what? Everywhere we've gone, we've developed new relationships. So they're going to change over time. Number uh, six, uh, relationships will change us over time. It'll change who we are. It'll change how we relate to people. It'll change how we preach to people and how we teach to people. Um, You know, some relationships that you will have will make you better, a better preacher. Um, uh, there are people in my life that I can think of who I've built friendships with, who listening to them preach and watching them, how they work with the church and how they deal with people has made me a better person. Uh, number seven, uh, relationships can be risky uh, because of the fear of danger. Uh, it's easy to put up walls that uh, sometimes that doesn't change. Um, uh, and that, but that doesn't create a lack of a need for relationships. Number eight, um, relationships are not an uh, are an end, but not a means to an end. They are an end, but not a means to an end. What I mean by that is, God, uh, we should never use people to reach. Uh, uh, we should never use people as a means to reach the end. We we don't use people. God gave us things to use, but He gave us people to love. And so relationships should be the end. Number uh, nine, um, the model for building strong relationships is always Jesus. It's always going to be Jesus. And so we, um, no one loves like Jesus. uh, No one sacrifices like Jesus. No one understands like Jesus. Nobody forgives like Jesus. Nobody comforts like Jesus. uh, Nobody cares like Jesus. um, Nobody Uh, confronts us with our issues like Jesus, and nobody helps us like Jesus did. And then uh, number 10, uh, and this is the last one, that when I was probably 20 years old and I was just getting ready to graduate from Fried Hardeman and I had accepted a a full-time job and I went to my dad. Uh, My dad at the time was probably about... uh, 40, I guess, no, 50, uh, 45, I think. And I said, uh, you know, I've, I've got this job I'm about to start. Would you give me a couple of your best pieces of advice? Uh, a couple of your best pieces of advice. And my dad, I wish some of you could have known him. He was a, he was a rather quiet man, and uh, he was a very humble man, and he didn't talk a lot, but... Uh, he was always very thoughtful and he would think a long time before he would answer a question. Like one time my brother Dale and and I and my dad were in Alaska. We were doing a a seminar in Alaska uh, for a men's uh, seminar. We were doing a gospel meeting up at uh, Isleson Air Force Base. Paul, you've probably been up there. And um, my dad decided he wanted us to drive down the Alaskan pipeline. And so we decided to do that one day and I felt like a week, but um, I was sitting in the front seat. My brother was sitting in the back seat, and we were talking about preaching. And um, I said to my dad at the time, he had been preaching in the same church for about 35 years. I said, uh, Dad, um, how, uh, or maybe Dale asked the question, how do, you, how do you stay at a place, one place for so long? And so my dad just thought for a little bit and waiting for some deep philosophical answer. And he said, you don't move. <laughs> and I said, is that all you got? You know, is that, that it? He said, yeah, you don't move. So I asked my dad, give me your two best pieces of advice. And again, I'm waiting for some kind of deep theological kind of answer. And my dad said, 
two things you need to remember. Number one, preach the word of God. And number two, love people. And, uh, you know, when you boil it all down as a preacher, when you boil down the task of preaching and the work that we do and the ministry that we're involved in, that's a pretty good summation, isn't it? Preach the word of God and love people. And if you do that as a preacher, um, your life will be rich and you'll bless other people and their life will be rich as well. So uh, I want to pray for all of you and uh, thank you for being here today. And after our prayer, I'm actually letting us out probably about five or six minutes early, but uh, hope you'll enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Father, we thank you for uh, loving us. We thank you for all that you do for us. And Father, we thank you that uh, for those of us who preach that we, we are so richly blessed uh, to get to be uh, co-workers with you in the greatest work that the world has ever known. And Father, we pray that you will bless each one of the men who are in this room who are preachers. Pray that you'll bless each one of the, the ladies who are married to preachers and every person who is here who perhaps is not a preacher, but who supports and cares about preachers. And Father, I want to pray especially today for some of these younger guys who are, who are uh, early in their preaching and ministry life and uh, who are growing and know that they're going to be a tremendous blessing to the church for many years to come. And we pray that you'll bless them in a special way and help them to have a faith and courage and strength and patience uh, as they go about their ministry. I pray that their ministry will be, will be rich and it will be filled with, with wonderful relationships and wonderful people uh, and, and wonderful um, times throughout their life. We're grateful for some of these older guys who have given so many years of their life in ministry and preaching and who continue to show us what it means to be the kind of man that you want us to be. Father, help us all to, to love you more and help us to love one another more. Help us to grow in our relationships. Help us through times of discouragement that will be what you want us to be. Father, help us to, to always, uh, help us always, always to preach your word and to love people. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.